by introducing our speakers, and they have a plethora of experience, so please feel free to elaborate when, <clears throat> once, I, once I hand over the speaker here, or the, the microphone. Um, we have Wayne. He's an experienced Agile professional who believes that work should be fun as well as productive. Drawing on a wide variety of experience, he's able to help individual teams and entire organizations to see measurable improvements in their efforts. And Kalina is a professional coach, enterprise agile coach and safe trainer with 10 plus years of experience shifting and transforming all levels of the organization to become more agile by influencing executives, champion, championing methodologies and guiding individuals and teams. Um, They've got some more interesting stuff in their bios. I'd love to hear more. Um, so, but at this point, I will hand it off to our speakers to start. And you do have permission to share now. Yes, I can see that. All right, so can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Wayne, please. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction, Barbara. We. Um, I don't know if there's too much more to say. I, uh, working as an agile coach in Toronto, Canada, and um, working with one of the big banks in 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 Canada as well as many of you are, are also doing. Uh, I don't know if there's too much more to tell than that. And we've, you know, introduced ourselves in the in the uh, time ahead. So uh, I'm not going to waste more of your time unless you got a question for me. <laughs> Lena, anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah, maybe I can add that I'm very inspired by cognitive science. Uh, neuroscience is very, very interesting for me. So I even brought today for you guys a uh, brain. So this is how it looks. Um, and I'm very inspired by positive psychology as well and professional coaching. So uh, yeah, so that's, that's all. Okay, so having said that, uh, I usually put a disclaimer at the at the front saying, uh, because I'm not a neuroscientist and I'm not a psychologist, I just love to read about it because it fascinates me. And so I, I'm, most of the material I pull in is, is from other research that's done. However, Kalina is educated in neuroscience. So I don't, I don't uh, need to say that disclaimer for her because she knows what she's talking about. So um, excellent. Uh, okay, so let's get going here uh, tonight. Kalina and I are going to talk to you a little bit about memory and why that's an important factor for coaches and scrum masters to give attention to. Uh, memory is an interesting but very misunderstood or often misunderstood function of the brain. It's fascinating and curious. It's the basis of who we are. It defines where we've come from and allows us to build on what we've done so that we can become more than we are today. And that's individual memories. You put a bunch of people together and you actually get a collective memory, which is even more interesting. And it's important to consider when any group of people need to learn or work together, which is just about all of us every day. So if you're a scrum master, an agile coach, or an organizational leader, then you know how difficult it can be for people and teams and even whole companies to try to learn and adapt and practice new ideas and concepts and techniques. And yet these new ways of working are what we are so eager to adopt and vital for the growth and sometimes even the survival of the companies that we work for. So when we're trying to introduce new ideas, we want to make sure that um, we're doing it in a way that, that helps to make things sticky. Uh, so what are we going to talk about? Think, well, it's going to be a memory. How does it work? Uh, you know, how is it connected to learning? What can go wrong with it? And uh, Kalina here has an agenda. Uh, I'll let her tell you a little bit about what's going to happen as we talk to you for the next few minutes. My agenda, Wayne? <laughs> well, it's our agenda. Yeah. Yeah, we have an agenda. So, uh, yeah, that's the, the agenda. Uh, we will start with uh, talking about the why. So everything starts with why. Why the memory is a central factor in agile coaching. We will ask ourselves some questions about the basic memory functions and then what can go wrong. So we will talk about a few strategies for sustained attention. 
and then uh, we will practice. So um, I strongly believe that we all learn best by practicing. So we have a lot of games for you. Uh, and at the end, we will finish this meetup with a moment for group debrief. So be um, uh, attentive uh, about everything because we have some questions for you at the end. And I have a, a disclaimer for today. So we have a lot of um, tools. We'll be using different tools. I'm using Canva for the presentation. We'll use Mentimeter as well. So we might have uh, some um, logistic, maybe slow down in the, in the logistics. So be patient with us. Um, I think it will be okay, but I just want you to mention that. All right, Wayne? Sounds good, perfect. Uh, so we're gonna start off here with just a little bit of a, of a memory quiz for you to demonstrate a couple of uh, memory functions uh, before we start to describe them. So you've got the little QR code there that's gonna take you to uh, a menti um, um, quiz thingy. And uh, we'll just give you a second to get that QR code on your phone or on your computer and then you can join us there i got my phone here so I, i'm going to give it a try just to make sure i can get in there too and you're seeing the right thing what's the what's the code oh just enter the email i don't know what it is and how can i do it on the computer yeah you can phone. use your phone for those who have phones and do a print um, basically of a picture take a picture of that and wayne maybe you have the link so we can share the link in the chat Yes, that's a good idea. Let me see if I can get the link. Oh, that's about cell phone number. Yeah, so on the cell phone, you just take a picture and it will show you a link. You click on the link and then you will get some questions because Wayne is a very curious person. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So the question is really, really. Let's see if I put this in the chat window here. If you're on the computer and you can't follow the QR code, then that should take you to the this same thing. Okay. I can try it. Yeah, that's that's all good. Works. Okay, so okay. it works. And then you send me a message, join private telegram group. What is this? Click uh, to reply oh, okay. to no, it should be menti, menti.com. Okay, so uh, Wayne, I guess you want to share your screen? Yes, okay, so this is, this is the screen you should be seeing. The question is, what did you eat for lunch two days ago? Yeah, we're gonna do a little word cloud here, see how many people ate something similar. So the, the question here is designed not to see what we ate for lunch, but to see if you can remember <laughs> something that happened two days ago. Okay, so this is a, this is a test of your short-term memory. And some of us have trouble what happened yesterday, let alone two days ago. So there we go. All right, let's, uh, if you've got your mentee still open, keep it open. We're going to go to the next question. Here's a test of your long-term memory. Where were you when the World Trade Center was hit on 9-11? Oh, New York. Uh -huh. Can you remember that? Now, I'm old enough to remember it. And Maybe most of you are too, but my kids now, however, are not. <laughs> so it's uh, funny how our how our brain works. Actually, uh, researchers have done studies about how we remember things and how we rebuild memories or uh, uh, that have happened in the past, and often we'll forget the order of things or the exact times of things and the further back we go the harder it is to be exact in our memory so they found that um, we often uh, anchor our memories with significant events so something like 9-11 was a significant event that becomes a 
a um, vivid memory for us and we actually remember the date, the time, maybe the place where we at, the people we were with, remember a lot of those details because that's a, a significant event. Okay. So we had a few people in Dubai. Interesting. Okay, and one more question here before we get on. Uh, did Darth Vader say, Luke, I am your father? And once we answer this, I'll tell you why this is a thing. And that's my favorite question. <laughs> you must be a Star Wars fan. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, now I had to, I didn't believe this. I had to go back and look it up, but um, what's going on here? Uh, this is, it's very close, but it's not exact. So the answer is no, Darth Vader did not say, Luke, I'm your father. If you go back and watch the movie, he said, no, I am your father. And then uh, and Luke freaks out and let's go. So the wording is slightly different, but we remember, everybody remembers this. Why, why do we remember it wrong? Well, it's part of our memory function. Uh, this, in fact, has been studied. It's called the Mandela Effect. And it's named after a researcher by the name of Fiona Broom, who wrote about her memory of Nelson Mandela. She wrote in a posted this in a blog site that she remembered him dying in prison in the 1980s. But in fact, he did not die in prison. He went on to become the president of South Africa and then later died in the year 20. Uh, 13. So why did she remember it wrong? And more interestingly, why did so many people on her blog post agree with her and they had the same wrong memory that she did? Huh. Called the Mandela effect. Yeah. So there's some weird things that go on with our memory. And um, uh, we, we, you know, we've been trying to understand this. Uh, neuroscience has, has been making some pretty good uh, advances in understanding of memory function. And that's helping us out a lot in, in uh, things like uh, Alzheimer's and dementia uh, in old age, but also in everyday learning. Uh, we can make use of these things as well. So, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and Kalina will take over. She's gonna tell us a little bit now <laughs> about basic memory functions and uh, what's going on in our brain. Okay. She still maintains that dad had an affair. I do remember some strange woman at the funeral, please. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, no, 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 no. I will maybe. Not, somebody's not mute. Yeah, can we mute everyone, maybe? I don't know. You got it. Yeah, okay. That's I that's great. Memorize every word that I was hearing. Mm. I thought it was part of the presentation. Oh yeah. <laughs> no. Me too. Yeah, I thought yeah, it was too, and then I'm like, wait exercise. a minute. <laughs> What's happening out there? Huh? <laughs> okay, no, it's not part of the presentation. So can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Um. So. I assume that you already know some of the things that we will mention here. Uh, some of the information that is stored in our brains is maintained, encoded, recode, depending on our needs. So did you know that the human brain can learn new skills and experiences at any time? So speaking about the brain, I'll show you again the brain. So this is the front part of the brain. So what is happening is that the brain keeps what it has learned and it reuses the accumulated knowledge. So everything we do in life every day depends on our capacity to memorize. So the memory can encode, which means receive new information. We can update it, update the existing information or retain, or we can retrieve stored information and use it for new experiences, learning new skills, or learning something new. So um, we talk sometimes about the memory consolidation that is very, very important in retention of what we have learned. And uh, this memory 
consolidation basically helps us to um, to store the information, the initially encoded information. So everything the brain encoded, retained, and retrieved will be used for future planning. So now we will watch, oops, that's not the right one. Just be patient with. The term yes. plasticity can, can I, comes from the Greek. Yes. Can I ask a question actually yes. regarding sure. this? Yeah, uh, sure. I'm looking at the logical shortcuts that the brain is, maybe you're talking about this later on, but the logical shortcuts, yes, I know I have the argument, but I've seen the argument 10 times. So I can jump from one place to the other. So basically that's what I call the logical shortcuts. Like mm -hmm. I don't need to have the same argument in my mind. I know the outcome of that if I'm put in the same situation. Where would okay. that fit? Okay, so that's that's interesting. Um, maybe we can take this agent sure. because I need more clarification for okay, for that. Not a problem. Okay. Sure. All right. Thank you. The term plasticity comes from the Greek word. So I will just stop it uh, because before we go into the video. Um, I think it's important to introduce what we call uh, long-term potentiation. So long-term potentiation is related to the memory consolidation process. And it's related also to the capacity to strengthen the, the connections between two neurons in the brains. So this long-term potentiation is related to what we call brain plasticity. So maybe you heard about it. So this is what you will learn in the video. Uh, and this concept of brain plasticity has been discussed a lot recently. And people sometimes use different names. The scientific name is brain, brain plasticity. And this concept is introduced in the video. This video comes from my professor from the Harvard University when I was studying neuroscience. Uh, so. This is approximately one, a little bit more than one minute. So uh, enjoy. I'll just put it at the beginning. Uh, yeah. The term plasticity comes from the Greek word plastikos, meaning mold. And when neuroscientists say that a circuit is plastic, they mean that it can be changed or molded by experience. This is the same root as the word that's used for what we call plastics, the material, and also the term plastic surgery, though obviously the sense in which each usage is invoked invokes the mold idea in a different way. You may have already heard this term neuroplasticity in advertisements for products that are supposed to make you smarter, and this isn't the first time that marketers have tried to appropriate a scientific term to try to sell you something. There's not a lot of evidence to support the idea that brain training programs like these have any real benefits, but the phenomenon of neuroplasticity is quite real. In fact, right now, as you watch this lesson, your brain is changing due to neuronal plasticity. Basically, anytime you remember anything, anytime you experience something new, anytime your nervous system adapts your walking gait to changes in the shape of your body, for instance, due to weight gain or weight loss, your nervous system is changing. It's happening basically all the time, tuning your nervous system to changes in the environment, changes in your behavior, and changes in your body. Okay, so now I will stop the sharing only for a few minutes because I want to hear from you. Uh, what do you think is the connection between brain plasticity, memory, and the learning of new information? So I just need a few ideas. Don't hesitate to unmute your, yourself. So what's the connection between learning, brain plasticity, and what you have seen so far? Well, the more you repeat something, the more you're, you're at ease with it. So yes, it is the first time that I learned something. It's a new information. But if I reread it and reread it and reread it, uh, the, the brain cells, the neurons are restructuring themselves in order for me to actually know what I'm talking about and to be easier to retrieve that memory if I need to in the future. Yeah. Absolutely. You got it, Alex. Thank you. 
Very uh, good summary. Anyone else who wanna add something different? If not, we'll just continue. That's all. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yep. I always like the phrase neurons that fire together wire together. Yes, I love it. I mean, yeah. yeah. I yeah. wish you guys could hear that comment in my whole uh, yeah, home theater system. They just blasted laughing mine, so it get very oh. good. Place. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to add something over here. The way I understood uh, the plasticity was basically it's your mind's adaptability, adaptability to change right instantly, right? Like sometimes you won't even know, but you change according to the situation. You inspect and adapt at that time. Is that what is? Is that my right understanding of uh, plasticity? Is that correct? Uh, so shaikh plasticity is mostly referred to our ability to um, to learn new information and the ability of the brain basically to to adapt. So very often people have those limiting beliefs that we when we uh, uh, got older, for example, we cannot learn or it's difficult to learn. No, if you train your brain, you can learn. It's just a question of having a plastic brain, like the more you train it, the more you can learn new things and new skills. So it's all about this. So the brain plasticity is related to that. So the brain is plastic. When we say that, it means that the brain is not fixed. So it can change. And how it can change is by strengthening those connections between two neurons in the brain. Right, Sheikh? Uh, and, and I will add to that, mm -hmm. it will, the brain is not cement and the, the, it's mm -hmm. not the connection between two neurons. Sometimes you have two neurons, you have three, you have the connection between two that influence the third, or you have three that influence two. So there is a lot of interaction yes. in the brain. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, okay. thank you guys. Thank you. Welcome. So let's, uh, let's yeah, move on. When is referred to the functions and is different from the, the previously functions? And this is, is does that have a uh, limitation of a time limit? Certain time you don't go back to the previously functioned? Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. We'll talk about short term and long term memory. And then if you want, we can come back to that question, Milky, and check if it if your question is answered or not. Okay. All right, so I will share my screen um, again, and then we'll move forward. And that's it. So talking about memory, uh, we chose to, um, to talk about two memories type, um, memory types today, short-term and long-term memory. So the short-term memory can retain information for few seconds only. I don't know if you knew that. For me, it was a surprise when I learned that for the first time. So the short-term memory has a variable capacity. And this capacity can be, um, can, can be basically can vary from seven to nine items for a normal, normal person. And if you get older, basically this, can, this memory can become weaker. And this is where people got it wrong. People think that later we cannot learn or it's too difficult to learn. No, we can learn, that's, that's not true. But at the same time, it becomes weaker, this short-term memory. And the long-term long memory, it can retain unlimited information. So very important, short-term memory, limited capacity, long-term memory, unlimited capacity, okay? So memory is linked to learning, of course. And when we talk about brain, different brain areas are involved. Um, and um, we, we should absolutely mention, so the, the front part, which is like the frontal part of the, of the brain, uh, we talk very often to parietal or temporal lobes, uh, the hippocampus, the amygdala. Uh, so um, what you should remember at this point is that the brain is composed of complex networks of neural connections. And there are different type of reactions 
happening in, in the brain. And we will focus on two brain areas. So we'll focus on the hippocampus and the amygdala. The hippocampus, we use the hippocampus for encoding of new information and also for uh, transferring basically the memory from short term to long term and for retrieval. So when we want to retrieve long term memories. And then we have the amygdala. We associate the amygdala very often with emotional response, response regulation of what we call automatic responses and memory consolidation. So um, when we talk about memory, a lot of things can go wrong. And some of them are related to uh, the ability to pay attention uh, to our sleeping habits. If we don't sleep well, definitely this will, will affect the memory. The exercise related to the oxygen in the brain, the, our nutritional habits and the rewards. So I'll just mention a few of them because uh, I'm very mindful uh, about the time we have. So um, related to the attention, for example, uh, when you give your full attention to something, this can enhance the, your capacity basically to memorize and to retain new information. If you have a partial or selective attention, this will definitely reduce the performance of this memory consolidation. And then um, if you pay your full attention, so those connections will become stronger in, in the brain. If you're not sleeping well, um, this can impact the ability of the brain to be plastic. And this can impact the ability of the brain to memorize. If you don't eat well, if you're lacking, for example, regular exercise, this will again impact your mental health and your ability to perform and to remember things. The lack of uh, motivation or uh, rewards uh, can affect your attention. And that's why we call in, uh, we say that in training, it's very important to um, to have reward-based training so that you can get better results. And we should not forget the habits. So habits can impact definitely the retrieval of those memories and the change of um, everything. So basically when we're trying to learn something new, we have old habits in place already. So there is some kind of replacement that needs to happen. And some other things that can go wrong. So I've just mentioned a few of them. Probably you know the biases already. Biases are distorting memories based on our beliefs, the belief systems we have. There is something that we call, uh, for example, blocking. So sometimes we cannot recall information. Sometimes we have false memories. So we think that something we remember is real, but actually it is not. It has never happened. Uh, sometimes we have uh, another thing that we call misattribution. So it's false memories of things that never happened. Um, and suggestibility, which is converting suggested ideas to inaccurate memories. So uh, that's it. A lot of things can go wrong. So um, be mindful, eat well, sleep well, have good uh, habits, take care of yourself. All right. So um, Wayne. Okay. So what we're going to do next here for the next little bit is take some of these um, ideas, these concepts, and then try to apply them practically to uh, our jobs as uh, agile practitioners in the companies we work for. And so we're going to we're going to look at five different areas where we can practice things that will help us to remember and therefore learn better and then uh, see how we can apply them. So there's some suggestions that we're going to go through that uh, you might be able to take home with you and into your job tomorrow. Uh, the five areas that we're going to talk about is how we pay attention, uh, how to avoid distraction, uh, connecting new ideas with old, 
learning in small chunks and then repetition to burn in those neural pathways that, that we're learning. So let's get into the first thing. Uh, we want to pay attention to the right things. So uh, if we ever hope to remember something long enough to make it a habit, then we're going to have to give it proper attention as we are first exposed to the idea. Kalina talked a little bit about that, that limited capacity of the short-term memory, the working memory. Uh, we, we have a limited amount of that and it occupies uh, our attention. So if we're focused on the right thing and we pay attention to the right thing, we're going to be able to encode that and, be, and it turns into a memory in our brain. But because we only have a limited capacity, our immediate can only give attention to a small number of things. And we have to, we, we're going to automatically, whether we're conscious of it or not, we're going to automatically exclude extraneous information. So this leads to an effect, a phenomenon called selective attention. Uh, a good example of selective attention happens uh, to victims of holdups. It's called the weapon focus effect. So if somebody is held up and there's a gun pointed in their face, they remember the gun, but they can't remember the person who held them up. So a sketch artist will say, give me a description of the person. They'll have no idea because it never went into their brain. They can't remember it because they weren't focused on it, focusing on the gun instead. We all have this capacity limitation, whether you realize it or not. And you might be surprised to experience how real this is. So we're gonna give you an example here. We have an awareness video we'd like you to watch. Uh, just watch through it and see if you can pay attention to the right thing. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Well, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. That's why, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> so there can, we go, see the first, can we see the first one also <laughs> again, please? <laughs> sure, if, if you'd like to, we can take some time. Do you want to? It'll be an extra two minutes, but that's okay. So do you want me to put it again? Just the first version, because now that seeing, I saw a few things, but it's, it's a whole different story. <laughs> okay, sure. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. That's why, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? 
Okay. So interesting when you Thank go back you. and look. Yeah. When you when, when you go back uh, and look and you actually see, you're paying attention to the details that you don't pay attention to when you see it the first time, right? And uh, it, th this is an interesting, um, it called selective attention, an interesting effect of the brain that's been studied many times. Uh, it's repeatable and, and we fall into it all the time, whether we realize it or not. And uh, uh, what's happening here is it, it's just the, the, um, the limited capacity for us to pay attention in our short-term memory. And so we block out other stuff. We just don't pay attention to it. Well, what it, what, how can we use this when we're working with teams and for ourselves when we're, when we're learning things? Well, we want to, if we want somebody to pay attention to something, we have to make it easy for them to pay attention to the right things and difficult for them to uh, be distracted by the un, unimportant things, which we'll get to in the next point. But how do we make sure that people pay attention to the right things? Um, Kalina, I don't know if you can, can you share and put the uh, next slide up? Here's a couple of suggestions. If you want people to focus on the work, use power of visualization for displaying work, say for instance, on a team board. We use scrum boards or Kanban boards and we conduct our meetings at the board. We refer to those boards often. People may physically interact with them. It's holding their attention. They're looking at the work. So we're, we're helping them to pay attention to the right things. Uh, we can create a room or team area that is conducive to focus. So we want to take out extraneous information. We, you know, make it easy for people to, to pay attention to their screens, to do their work, uh, in meetings, to talk to each other. If they're learning, we've got learning materials that make it easy for them to pay attention to. Uh, when we teach a new idea, we want to make sure to uh, remove some of those extraneous items that draw people's attention away and we'll get to distraction in just a second. But that's why it's important, for instance, when you're teaching a class, maybe no cell phones or turn your laptops off because those things take our attention away. We can't actually remember uh, the, the material that we're learning because it's never been encoded in our brain. And uh, we wanna develop a routine that is, uh, helps uh, people pay attention uh, to the right parts of the work at the right time. So a stable schedule where they don't have to think about what's coming next, it, it becomes automatic. So we use, uh, for instance, the schedule of scrum events. People don't have to think about what's coming next and they can focus on the right things instead of focusing on, you know, what room I, am I in now or what time is it gonna start? So selective attention is the main reason why authorities are so anxious to have us to avoid texting while we're driving. And if we switch to the next slide there, you're gonna see a picture. Uh, by the way, that video was for um, you know, driving awareness. And here's a sign that highlights the problems with texting while driving. This is a real thing and it causes accidents. And that's why it's important to pay attention to. So that helps us to get into the next suggestion that we have for you. If we wanna learn something and we wanna memorize it, not only do we have to pay attention, we have to avoid distraction. So that's the second thing, avoid distraction. Let's, uh, let's go back to the quiz. Have you got your mentee quiz still open? And I'm gonna share screen. Kalina, can I grab yes. it from you? Yes. Okay, so here's a quiz about distractions. Uh, this was a study that was done in the US. How many times a day do you think US adults and teenagers check their cell phones? 10, 25, 50, or 150? Oh, everybody's answering 150. Yes. Yeah, actually, you are correct. Believe it or not, the study found 150 times a day. That's every six to seven minutes during waking hours. We're checking our phones. Whenever we're checking our phones, it's distracting us from whatever else it was that we were doing before we checked our phones. So maybe it's working, maybe it's meeting, maybe hopefully not it's driving uh, because we want to avoid that for sure. But this is a huge distraction. And it's just getting worse in, in today's society. We have so many different things that can grab our attention. Um, and, and it's important because for us to learn new things uh, and work with other people, we have complex interwoven, time-delayed, shared information with other people. It calls for a high degree of cognitive processing in, the, in that prefrontal cortex in our brain. 
if we're distracted with extraneous information and then it rapidly switches, we rapidly are distracted by different things, it can severely affect our ability to uh, learn and remember things. Um, so here's some uh, strategies for avoiding distraction. Uh, first of all, be aware of what happens. So this is, this is why we're talking about it this evening, is um, if we're aware of what's going on in our brain, the fact that we have selective attention and the fact that distractions will affect us, then we won't fool ourselves into thinking that we can get away with it. Uh, there's really no such thing as multitasking. People think they can do that, but we can't. We need to pay attention to the right things. So awareness is the first step. Um, and you can tell your teams about it. Play them that video if you want. It's a kind of an interesting thing. You can do it a retrospective. Um, we want to limit accessibility to sources of information. So work on one screen. Uh, turn notifications off. You know, in a, on the Mac and even on the PCs now, you get the little notifications popping up and the notification window flashing in and out. That's distracting you from your work. You can turn those things off. Uh, work in a quiet space. Turn your cell phone off. The, these things will help us to avoid distractions. Um, one interesting thing, if we're, if we're trying to uh, help people learn a new concept, make the learning fun, gamify it. It decreases our boredom because when, with so many different things to pay attention to, we easily get bored. And, and studies have shown this, this effect is increasing. People get bored more quickly with something and then they'll switch. So if we can decrease the boredom, make it fun, it holds people's attention longer. And then, of course, reducing anxiety. Uh, Kalina talked about getting good sleep, uh, a good diet, setting expectations with schedules, priorities, those types of things. If we're in, in peak mental capacity, we, of course, will learn better and we won't be as tempted to be distracted. So that's our strategy for distraction. Now, the third point, I'm going to hand it over to Kalina to uh, talk about connecting ideas. Oh, one second. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so um, what we're going to do now, first we'll start with questioning ourselves. So I'm sure that in the past, you all have met someone new. This happens to me very often. Uh, so you meet someone new and then you introduce yourself. The other person will introduce him or herself and then they will mention their name. And then like a few seconds after that, you forget it. It's all gone, right, Alex? Yeah, I can see that, yeah. It happens to me all the time. Uh, or maybe sometimes you are in a conversation and you are putting all your focus into that conversation and then you cannot remember what, basically what, what, what happened in the conversation. Um, maybe because of the distractions, maybe the attention was not uh, good enough. Or sometimes what can happen is, uh, oh, with me, this is happening very often. So I have my sunglasses. So I prepare myself to uh, go out of the house and I want to go somewhere. And then I, I leave the, the sunglasses somewhere and I forget immediately, like a few seconds after. So in that moment, I am in automatic mode. I'm like a robot huh? because my short term memory capacity has been uh, he has been full basically so I don't have space so that's what's happening so um, yeah so we'll do an exercise right now and uh, we'll learn uh, we'll put in place some strategies so one of the strategies to remember is to make associations for example so we can associate one thing with something else so sometimes we call that a word association trick um, we uh, we can also uh, do some associations, let's say with the name or with the situation that happened. Uh, so it depends, there are different type of associations. So uh, what we're going to do, we'll try to remember the different domains of business agility from the agile space. Um, and we'll use a technique uh, called uh, PI, 
<laughs> and this technique comes uh, from uh, Jim Kiewick, who is the author of the book Limitless. And this technique is very interesting because it uses different parts of the brain and it helps you by association, basically, to learn new things. So you can use it in any context. Uh, so uh, PI stands for place imagination in twine. So what we're going to do, so we'll try to remember those different domains of business agility, and we'll use different locations from your head to uh, make some associations, okay? So are you willing to try that? Do I have your attention? Good. Yes, yes. Perfect. All right, so let's do it. Uh, okay, so how can I reduce this? Maybe I cannot. We'll talk about it, that's fine. Okay, so this is a picture from the Business Agility uh, Wheel, uh, Business Agility Institute. Uh, you can see different domains. So we will try to remember right now the, uh, the different um, domains here on the wheel. So we will start with the leadership. So uh, you can see the leadership here on that on the left part. So imagine that the top of the head uh, is like a hat and this hat is for leadership. Then imagine your eyes and those eyes can see a dollar sign for value, the value we develop, the value in products, and then you have your ears. So those ears can say what people are saying for culture. So we have here engaged culture. And then you have the mouth. And the mouth is for the voice of the customer. So here on the top, you don't see everything, but basically is customer centricity. So that's the voice of the customer. And then the neck moves the rest of the head. And we use that for operation, flexible operation. All right, do you get this? Because I have a quiz coming now for you. Repeat it back to us. <laughs> yeah? Say Repeat that again. Repeat it back to us. Yeah. Repeat, Repeat it again? Yes. Okay, perfect. So the top of the head is like the hat for leadership. We have people first leadership. And then the eyes can see the dollar sign for value. So we have value-based delivery. And then we have the ears that can hear what the people are saying for culture. So we have engaged culture. And then we have the mouth uh, for the voice of the customer customer centricity on the top. And then we have the neck that moves the rest of the head for flexible operations. Okay, that should be enough win. <laughs> Everybody memorized it? <laughs> Good, so uh, let's do it. You can unmute yourself. So uh, we will try to um, recall what we remembered, all right? So the, te the top of the head is for... Everybody's shouting at leadership, so yeah. Leadership, yes, good. The eyes can see a dollar sign for? Yeah, your delivery. My daughter said value, okay. Yeah, good. <laughs> the family support. Yeah. Uh, the ears can hear what people are saying for? Culture. Yeah, perfect. Culture engagement is what I heard, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And then the mouth is the voice of? Customer. customer. Yeah. Customer Yes, customer centricity. Yes. And then the neck moves the rest of the head operations. for operations. Operations. Flex, flexible operations. It worked well. Yeah. Hey, they got it. <laughs> yeah. Now, if yep. anybody ever quizzes you about what are the five areas on the uh, wheel of business agility, you'll have a uh, you'll have a memory trick to recall those five things immediately every time. You'll be you'll be amazed at how that works. I was just thinking of uh, making a, a face and then just putting all those things there. So even that thing, like, fine. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, 
Uh, okay, Kalina's moved the slide on here. So, so here's some now. So this is an interesting technique here to connect new ideas with old. And uh, this may remind you of other memorization type techniques that you may have heard before. You remember Sherlock Holmes, he used to have a mind palace. Yeah, he made use of the places, visuals, and connected ideas uh, to organize thoughts and memories as if they were in a room or a mansion. And he, he, he uh, would use these things to uh, store and readily remember the information. So things like word association, uh, mnemonic devices like songs and poems, Remember your ABCs in school? We all remember ABCs because remember the song. Acronyms, acrostics, they can all be utilized for extreme feats of memory. Uh, so for instance, have you ever heard the phrase, every good boy deserves fudge? What is it supposed to be for? Do you remember? Something musical. My daughter said music notes or what is that? Is that, what is that? Music yeah. notes? So, uh, okay, notes. okay. Yeah, notes. it's the music scale, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, yeah, you got it. There you go. Uh, this one I learned in school. I don't know if you had it or not. Man very early made jars stand up nearly perpendicular. You remember, yes, remember what that is supposed to help you remember? What? We, I, I had a different one. My very energetic mother just served us nine pizzas. <laughs> ah, yes. Okay. Nice. I like it. Those are the planets. Yes, those are the order of the planets. And that was when Pluto was still included as a planet. Now, if you drop Pluto off, I don't know what goes on with the acronym. But anyway, uh, that's an acrostic. And it that is helps back us. On. Uh, Pluto is back on. Is it? Oh, good. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> I always liked Pluto. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, anyway. OK, so so there's, there's connecting ideas with rhyming words, phrases, pictures. Mm -hmm. it, it's all ways to help us uh, encode the memory and get it stuck in our mind. Okay, so those are those are good. Uh, let's go on to our fourth, fourth item, uh, and that's to learn in small batches. Um, yes, so uh, we'll get into Pi Day in just a second here, but uh, Nelson Dellis is a four-time USA memory champion and the grand master of memory. Some of his feats include recollection, including memorizing 10,000 digits of pi and the order of more than nine shuffled decks of cards and lists of hundreds of names after hearing them only once. Well, how does he do this? Well, one of the things he does is he breaks down these new ideas into small chunks and then he learns little bits of information that can be strung together through things like word association. This is sometimes called chunking or small batch learning or sometimes called micro learning. And this allows us to reduce fatigue. It gives us processing time to build memory and harnesses the power of patterns. So let's see if we can do this today. Uh, March 14th was Pi Day. Did you have a pie on Pi Day? It's called Pi Day because it's March 14th or 3.14, the first few digits of pi. How many digits of pi do you think you can remember? Let's try this by chunking. And, and this, is, uh, this is how we do um, uh, remembering phone numbers, by the way. We chunk them down and that's why they're broken into bits. So let, let's try this. You look at the pi as we're, as we're thinking about it. The first three digits are 3.14. Then let's do sets of three. So it's 159, 265, 358. Try it again. One or 3.14159265358. Repeat that to yourself for a time or two. And then Lena's going to take the uh, slide off the screen and go back to Menti. See how many of those digits you can remember. I'm going to repeat them once more before we enter them into. Uh, Menti, 3.14, 159, 265, 358. Okay, see how many you can remember. I can't share the screen. You cannot share the screen? No, I've got the... Uh, 
post disabled screen sharing. Oh, I did not. I might have. Sorry. There we so, go. Okay. Trying to remember numbers. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> remember numbers <laughs> and share the screen at the same time. <laughs> That's a tough one. 13, okay. 13, Dalia, correct? Jake, did you enter 13? Pi is not 13. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so at, we, we've got some varied results, and this is this is typically hard to do. Um, but if we repeat it often enough, then we will get. Uh, it, if we repeat the small chunks often enough, then it's easier for our brains to remember. Okay, so I did. I, did, I expected this one to be the hardest one, <laughs> and sure enough, it is. I guess I didn't listen to it correctly when, sorry, I, I, I took a different approach, but that, yeah, I got it now. Okay. I mean, Sounds for good. me, I already know the first four digits because you know, we used it all the time. It's just the last couple of us, I only tried to remember those ones. The first four I already know from school, university, engineering, that's all it is. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, I didn't we had a little- directions. Sorry? You I didn't follow directions. I counted the number of digits. Okay. That I can yeah. remember. Just like me. Okay. Oh, I see. That's what the 13 is. Oh, you can remember 13 digits. That's pretty good. Okay. Uh, no, mine was this... five. Oh, you got five. Well, five's good too. We did a little fun thing at home. Uh, we made the Wi Fi password uh, at home uh, nine digits of pi. So the kids had to remember it if they wanted to. <laughs> If they wanted to get Wi-Fi, uh, my daughter actually won a prize. I think it was in grade six or something because she was the only one in the class who who could remember what Pi was. Um, anyway, so it worked out good. I'm going to stop the share and uh, we'll go back to our last point. Okay, so this that was uh, small chunks. And uh, now the other thing that we can do to remember, uh, we talked a little bit about before we alluded to the fact that um, repetition will help us to remember things. So now that we have a new idea, uh, and whether it's us trying to learn something new like Pi or it's our team uh, learning a new concept, uh, we've learned in small batches, we need a way to remember it. So recall the one of the first problems that we have with memory, it's called transience, or it's the tendency for us to forget something gradually over time. Transient uh, was one of the first memory effects to actually be studied in the late 18, 1800s. Uh, researchers on the subject actually plotted out how much we tend to forget over time. And the graph that you're looking at now is called the Ebbinghaus Forgetting Curve because it was named after the uh, memory researcher who studied this effect. And it shows just how soon and how much we forget things. And uh, sure enough, there's a fair bit of drop off right at the beginning there in the, in the first few hours of us getting a new idea. If we, if we don't reinforce that in our memory, it will go. It's, it, we fail to encode the long-term memory is what's happening there and we just can't remember. So it's lost and it's gone forever. There was an interesting side effect though that uh, was discovered as they were researching this. And it was found that if the information is before it's lost, it bumps us back up to the top of the forgetting curve. And then we start to forget a little bit more, but then if we repeat it again, it bumps, bumps us back up to the top. And if we do this several <laughs> times, that repeating curve or the forgetting curve actually flattens out a bit and we're able to remember. What's going on here is, of course, that neuroplasticity, our brains are building and reinforcing the neural network that supports that memory that we're trying to encode. And of course, then we stand a far better chance of remembering the information. This is vital if we want teams to learn and build new habits. Now, you might have read Malcolm Gladwell before. He's famous for writing in his book, Outliers, that it takes time and repetition to become an expert at something. In fact, he suggested that to build a new habit, and to become good at it, you can only be considered an expert after 10,000 hours of practice. Now, of course, this includes more than just memory, but learning and remembering a new concept is usually the first step in, in building a new habit. So if you want to get off on the right foot, if you want to uh, remember a new concept that you want to become an expert in, make sure that you repeat it. And 
repeat it uh, fairly soon and repeat it a few times. Uh, let's go on to the, the next slide here. And we're gonna tie the, these two ideas together with some suggestions. Okay, so we wanna, I want our, turn, our teams to learn a new concept, try chunking and repetition. Don't try to learn for more than one hour at a time. If you do, take breaks, especially between ideas. So try to, con try to group the ideas into a chunk and then move on to a different idea. That will help us to remember it. Uh, if you're gonna run, say for instance, a full day class, don't run one full day class, do two half days with a break in between so people can go home, sleep on it, and then come back the next day. It's amazing how much more they'll remember than a full day of learning. Uh, repeat the information back immediately and in your own words. So we can use something like the liberating structures of um, uh, one, two, four, all, where we're repeating it to ourselves, we're repeating it to the people around us, and we're repeating it to the whole room. And we have to explain it, so it makes us think about it. Uh, we review information at the end of the session. Uh, perhaps we suggest that people journal about it at the end of the day when they get home, write it down. It engages their eyes and their ears and their uh, um, hands as they write. Uh, then try to explain it to somebody else tomorrow and then explain it again next week. And if we practice that several times, then it becomes automatic and we have a much, much better chance of remembering things. Okay, so that is the practice, five practice areas. Do you remember what the five practice areas were? They were pay attention. Yeah. Yeah, do you, oh, no, I'm just doing the practice areas. We, we, we can do the five things of the wheel if you want to uh, try that one again too. But uh, yeah, we want to pay attention. We want to avoid distractions. Connect um, new ideas. Connect, connect new ideas, ideas with old. That's right. Use smaller chunks. Chunking, yes. And uh, repeat and, it as, as often as you can, repeat it, yeah. And repetition, good, we got the five areas. Okay, excellent. Uh, and I think that is the end piece. So, um, Kalina, do you wanna wrap it up for us? Yes, uh, so let's, uh, let's ask uh, everyone, Wayne, I'm very curious. Um, so what have you learned today and how can you put that in practice? So the question is, how can you put in practice what you have learned today? And please unmute yourself and just jump in. Uh, definitely two things really caught my attention is uh, the first is the Kalina, uh, when she talked about have a proper sleep, uh, proper uh, exercise and nutrition food because I've been uh, neglecting all of them. <laughs> so, so that's uh, actually causing a lot of my performance. So actually that, it reminded me, which I already knew what I should have been doing with my regular life. So her uh, presentation actually motivated me a little bit uh, to realize that I, I was a little tired today. Then I was like, okay, so I usually need to go back to follow those. Like ever since you grew up as a kid, you know, you know everybody talks about all of this, Entire my life, I heard about it, but never actually put it to practice uh, um, continuously, which is very important, not getting younger anymore. And the second part is when I saw that five factors you're talking about, that's I look at it as a, uh, as a process, which is like uh, very important and which is we're always neglecting that. So these two factors that I really motivate me a lot. So I think I really want to keep put it into my practice. Okay, this is great. Thank you, Milky. And related to the sleep habits, I noticed for myself that when I don't sleep well and I don't sleep enough, when I wake up in the morning, first, of course, I am tired, but then like my whole way of looking of at everything is negative. So I become very, very much more negative than uh, I am usually. So if I sleep enough, then it doesn't matter what happens during the day. I always look at it in a positive way. So it influences perspectives. Please, um, Pepe. Do you have a comment? I can see your uh, hand. Uh, one, one, one comment to, uh, you know, your, your question was, how do we 
apply the knowledge going forward. And I think that is just kind of reinforcing that um, I, I'm, I'm keen on doing trainings on small chunks, like four, four hours tops. And, you know, what I learned today is just reinforces that. Um, and then, and, and I guess I have a question for, for you. So I keep hearing this, I don't know if it's a pet peeve, but when I hear people, you need to unlearn something. Uh, to me, it sounds weird. Maybe it's because English is not, is not my first language, but to me, I learned that you form habits in, you know, you, you learn habits through repetition, observation, and so forth and so on. And like, say, if you want to quit smoking, uh, you can't unlearn how to smoke, but you can learn something else that will replace it. So do you have any comment to unlearn things? Is that such a thing? So um, we can talk about it a lot uh, because it's another very interesting topic, uh, Pepe. Um, we actually cannot unlearn. Uh, you can replace one habit with another one. Yeah. And if you want to, to quit smoking, myself, I was smoking and I quit smoking by doing this. Yep. And yep. that's how you do it. So you, you need to analyze my suggestion to you, analyze what is causing you to smoke in which moments, for example, you smoke. For example, you might be feeling uh, extreme in terms of feelings. That's an example. So maybe you're very sad or, or very excited. And then you go for a smoke because of feelings, right? Right, right, right. Or eating, right? Emotions. Or eating, emotions, absolutely. So uh, yeah, so that's what need to be fixed. What do you do in those cases? And you replace, that's it. And you repeat, memorize, repeat. Thank you. Welcome. Uh I just I, I just put a link in the chat window to an interesting YouTube video that you might like to watch. It's called The Backwards Brain Bicycle. And it talks a little bit about this concept of unlearning. Yeah, it's 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 kind of interesting. They they built uh, the the engineers that this guy's friends were engineers and they for a, for a joke, they built him a bicycle when you turn the handlebars one way, the wheel would actually turn the opposite direction. So it would steer backwards and he tried to ride this thing. And of course, you know, riding a bicycle is something that we do from a kid. It's burned into our brains when, we, you know, <laughs> you get the balance and everything. There's a lot of stuff going on in your brain uh, as you, as you learn to ride a bike. Uh, and then to try to learn how to ride a bike that steers backwards almost requires us to forget the old way of riding a bike and learn. So what's going on? And, and you'll see it in the video. It's just absolutely amazing. All of it, like he can't do it. He just can't do it. And all of a sudden it clicks and bang, he's riding backwards <laughs> and it works. And then he tries to go back to his regular bicycle and he has the same problem again. Because what's happening is the neurons are firing in a certain way. The brain is learning how to steer in a different way. And the old connections are actually uh, disconnecting because he, we, we don't need them anymore. And then, yeah, the new connections for steering a different way are forming. And then finally, when there's enough of them to form, then you get it and, and you've learned something new. But there is a little bit of that whole, um, where we don't use the neural pathways, so they disconnect as part of the neuroplasticity. It's an interesting study. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so I the, over, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, please. Yes, I, I want you to give you another example Imagine if you are uh, in the beginning of a forest and then there is a highway. So you wanna go to the other uh, end of the forest. So yeah, a habit is basically that highway. So if you always take the same highway, this is because you have a strong habit. And then if you wanna learn something you imagine a small pathway, a small path in the forest and uh, the road is not the same as the highway, right? So every time when you're at the beginning of the forest, you might be asking yourself if you are aware that you have a choice, so you need to make a choice. Am I going to take the highway, which is my old habit, 
or I will try the small path in the forest, which is the new one. And the more you take the small path in the forest, this smart, uh, path slowly becomes the highway, basically. So it will replace the highway and the highway will not be a highway anymore. So that's that's how, how it happens. So those are like the connections between the neurons that become stronger or weaker. I was yes. sharing my personal experience. It'll take a minute or something. So mm -hmm. I was 18 when I started driving my car in India. It's on the other side of the road. Not It's on the left hand. It's, it's um, right hand drive and the traffic goes on the left, left side. Okay. So at 23 years of age, I go to Dubai to get a job. And then I'm in line with a lot of people who are, you know, are saying that, you know, they're hearing it, they're, they're doing driving for the first time, right? So this guy gives like 10 classes for them and then 10 classes for the other. So I'm at the back. I said, I know everything. I know driving. I'm driving on the other side of the road and then I know everything, right? So I went and I said, oh, hi, hi. He said, have you driven before? I said, I've driven before and I've driven in India on the other side. He gave me 20 classes. I said, why? What are you doing? I know driving. He said, yeah, 10 classes to unlearn what you have uh, learned in India on the other side and the next 10 classes to practice driving on the right side. So, so I... That's what he told me, right? So practice. I practiced driving on the other side uh, from a from a you know from a manual car. Everything changed for me. Uh, just that I have to drive on the other side, and, and the signals and the roundabouts as well. They were they were very tricky for me to go and, and signal and everything. And my brain, you know, just transformed. Just practicing. He gave me twenty classes for a reason, I guess. He would have seen a lot of students like me, uh, you know. So that's one of the examples I just thought about when you just all said that. So. Yeah. I know other, otherwise we'll be hitting some people in the corner. <laughs> exactly. So, so I found it driven with the same 10 classes with the mindset of, you know, driving on the other side. You just imagine how rough it would have been and then the roads there. <laughs> so, yeah, that's something which came to my mind. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I thank you for sharing. I have a question. So when you, like Kalina, you mentioned that uh, you have a two choice, correct? You go to the old habit of taking the highway or you take the new way of taking to the forest. And we happen to always take the highway because like it is something we're used to it. Does that have fear has anything to do with the decision-making when it comes to that? I feel like a fear actually creates a lot of uh, decision-making issues. Of course, of course, it's related to decision-making as well because first you need to make a decision, right? which yeah. way you want to go and then the new way is always related to some kind of fear because it's unknown you're not used to it and the old way you know what to expect so there's no uncertainty it's a highway you know how it works yeah mostly it's right? a fear of failure correct probably probably that but that's an assumption right now there's some kind of fear out there Okay. There can also be a fear of the unknown that uh, we just don't know what's going on the new path or the new way of doing it. But you can see how things like this, they can really affect the teams that we're working with, especially if they've been used to working in a certain way for a long time. Maybe it's a waterfall way. They've got a pattern established. And then we come along and say, let's try this agile thing or let's, let's you know, organize our work differently or let's, let's work in a different way, a different space, uh, communicate differently. And it's they have to there is, a, there is a bit of unlearning of the old way before we can develop the new habit. And there's a fear that we've got to overcome as well as, as we go through uh, this with, with people. So any kind of a change can be difficult mm -hmm. until the, the brain adapts and learns, learns these things. So we're, we're just looking for ways to make that easier for our, our people to, to handle and work through. Absolutely. And then we do, yes, please. What happened, your process, is very similar to other process and the outcome is the same expected result of uh, success. How do you make that to be convincing the other, other way that you are a better way? It's like, you know, a lot of times I see that in an agile mindset, like when company comes in and it starts changing whole thing into agile and there is the other way has been working out and, and you come in to try to change that. In traditional way, like, Otherwise, working too, as uh, it's almost come up with the same kind of certainty in terms of like success, right? And I, I know that you guys also struggle in that case. I don't know how you guys do it, but I see that cases like there's a fight between two type of mindset, right? Agile and others. Like same way, 
a uh, lot of times I saw that uh, project manager hates Scrum Master. <laughs> it's like they don't work very well together. <laughs> You're always fighting with each other. I've seen that in the industry because I've, I've worked in the corporate industry for so many years. I was like, oh, I don't know want to get into that. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> It's kind of funny uh, that you mentioned that uh, because if uh, two different ways produce the exact same result, then yep. why would you change from one to the other? Because the change itself requires effort. Uh, I've always, uh, I, I like the analogy I heard one time. It's like packing, it's like moving your house, right? You sell your house and you move, you pack up all your stuff in a box, uh, in a truck, and then you move to another city and you unpack it. Uh, why in the world would you go to all that trouble and disruption if you were like in exactly the same house with exactly the same setup uh, with everything exactly the same as you had it back in your old place. Uh, it'd be crazy to, to, to do that. Uh, usually you're moving for some kind of an advantage. Maybe you're closer to work. You've started a new job. Maybe you have uh, got married and you moved in with somebody or, you know, you, you moved to a new house that has room for your family. There's, there's a reason behind it. And it's a good reason, a reason enough for you to go to all the trouble of moving. So, that's what we want to focus on when we're doing agile transformation is uh, we're not just switching for the sake of change. There's distinct business advantages to doing it this way. And we have to articulate those and be very clear on what they are. Often companies just go into it and say, hey, we want to do agile uh, without any reason behind it. And, and of course, people are not going to you know, want to do that. They're not going <laughs> to, they don't see any reason for it because we haven't articulated. We don't even know what the reason is then uh, yeah, we're going to have trouble with that for sure. But that's um, yeah. that's hopefully what an experienced coach can help you with because we're going to try to avoid that kind of thing. <laughs> just a question that you said two, I mean, I'm, I'm just talking to Milky here. Milky, you said two uh, frameworks or styles or methodology, whatever you use. I mean, you said that they they uh, the same result, right? I would question that because Project management, I know you take six months to a year to deliver something and what we deliver and what just Wayne and everybody else should use deliver in small chunks. So you deliver your time to market just increases. So I, I question that the result is the same. So uh, yeah, just putting it out there. So there is a change, there is, there is you know, and, and the, the other thing is project management, you spend like a huge amounts and then you come to know later, but agile makes you fail fast. You come to know very quickly that you fail faster. Right? That's the other thing. I, I doubt that two things produce the same results. So I questioned that in the first place. So um, just questioning that, yeah. Yeah, so there is a question, so like as Wayne saying and Karina saying, that's where the great uh, agile coach come in to really clear this out to the organization so they can actually move into the new uh, new process. Okay, so um, I'm not sure, Sherry, do you have a comment or a question? I'm not sure how much time we have, um, Barbara? Um, well, we're, we're essentially out, out of time, but there really isn't yeah. like a fixed <laughs> schedule. We just try to set some expectations around how much time there is. But I mean, I don't want to stop anybody from asking any, any additional questions. This has been fantastic. Um, I think I thought Sherry, I mean, she did a great job of taking notes. So thank you very much. I actually thought at some point that it was kind of part of, she was kind of a planted person because the repetitiveness is, is there. So somebody would say something and then she would write it and it almost helped, helped me, you know, remember it better, but yeah. there is the distraction factor. So um, I'm, I, I struggle with that. So, Sherry, uh, you, you put a question. Did, did you want us uh, to to talk about that before we close off tonight? Oh, my, my. There's an example question. Learning about agile jargon for the first time, the term increment. How might you introduce what an increment in terms of the sprint goal or the, in terms of product goal? So, yeah, trying to introduce a new idea here. So I, I, you know, I'm talking a new idea, talking about some of the concepts we've learned. Uh, I would use visuals, um, maybe play a game. Uh, the penny passing game, I think, is a great game to uh, demonstrate the value of incremental delivery. Um, gets people out of their frame of mind and having a little bit of fun. And then if you if you start uh, playing a game like that, you can you can really powerfully show the 
the um, idea of incremental delivery. Um, have them write down the phrase. Uh, use visuals, visuals and uh, repetition. Um, the the book uh, Better Value Value Sooner Safer Happier is a really interesting book. In there, he says uh, repeatedly, <laughs> uh, "Say it again, say it again, say it three times." When you've said it three times, say it three more, and by the time you get to six times, you're halfway there. So just keep repeating the ideas. And uh, that's that's probably one of the best things that we can do for our, our teams to help them with new concepts like that. There's a question here, Wayne, about like the penny paste, penny passing, right? Was it Joe Little or who was that? I, if I remember correctly, was that who's, uh, uh, I don't know whose idea that was. Somebody asked a question here, like, what is the penny passing game? Uh, 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 well, do, do a little Google search. It's an old game. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been around for a long time. I learned it from, um, yeah, Joe. Uh, I'm uh, forgetting the name. I, Joe I, Little. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Joe Little. Okay. Well, I mean, and but now I, I, in Canada, you can't pass penny anymore. There's no more pennies. <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah. I have <laughs> a big bag of them. We have. I think even I mean, you, I, we have yeah. lots of pennies. Yeah, you have to go back to India to get to the penny post. <laughs> Uh, hey, Sheikh, uh, if you are interested, uh, there is one safe, safe Agilist uh, course material, which is there on the SAFE uh, website, and uh, they have illustrated this penny passing example. So that will be a great yes. reference for you. I know we have run this, me and Wayne together have run this in Montreal, BMO and in CGI and all those places. So we know this game, but we're trying to recollect the source. Maybe they've added in the SAFE like six. I think the version now is six, I think, right? So it, it just came out last week. There's some changes, but I didn't go through everything. But yeah, thank you. Anyway, I'll just have a look. There's yeah, probably a new version called Tuni Passing. Okay. Yes, Tuni <laughs> Passing. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's good. Anyway, well, uh, I, I think we're out of gas too. But thank you very much for having us. Come tonight. Yeah, great. thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Wayne. Thank I'm going to uh, pass the mic to, to Pepe and uh, Thank you, Wayne and Kalina. Uh, I think we're just going to just close here for um, announcing our next meeting, and I'm going to stop the recording.